All of us are trying to understand this huge security failure. Uh, was this the police? Was this Secret Service? The FBI is now getting involved. To help me go through this, I have former CIA operative J. Michael Waller. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining me today. Nice to be with you. So um, just so, for some background, uh, Michael was a former CIA operative. He's an author and strategist. He's also a senior analyst at the Center for Security Policy. Boy, nothing uh, rings security policy like what we've been dealing with. Um, I, I think you would agree in the absence of information, people will jump to conclusions. We are getting very little information from the FBI, the police, Secret Service on this failed assassination attempt on Donald J. Trump, where the protectee was actually hit but not killed. What do you think is going on? What are your thoughts about this assassination attempt? First of all, any time a presidential candidate or a protectee is actually harmed, that shows that the system has failed. Now, when a system fails, you need people to come up and take responsibility for that. Right now, we have the Secret Service passing the buck, and then the Secretary of Homeland Security, who's in charge of the Secret Service, saying he has 100% confidence in the leader of the Secret Service who failed in the mission. So you've got a lot of problems right there. Uh, now, the FBI has taken direct authority, direct control of the, of the investigation of this, uh, which leads to other problems because the FBI has lost so much of the public trust and it has made the, um, the surviving victim of this assassination attempt, the main target, uh, it had already made him not just a, a target of criminal investigation, but a target of disinformation and, and constant harassment with the, uh, the phony crossfire hurricane uh, counterintelligence probe that was, you know, fueling the whole Russia collusion narrative. So, so really the FBI is entirely the wrong organization to be leading this investigation. The problem is we don't have anything else. I know uh, over on Twitter, Judicial Watch was saying that they would be willing to do an unbiased, independent investigation because they, they share the same concern that you just addressed with my audience is, you know, the, the FBI, not maybe not as a whole, but individuals within the FBI played a major role in spying on Trump, investigating Trump after his presidency, um, you know, raiding his home with permission to use, you know, excessive force if necessary. They laid out the, a, a photo that made Trump look bad. Um, they, did, they sat on the Hunter Biden laptop uh, even after it came out uh, and essentially allowed Joe Biden to walk into the White House. Uh, so yes, I, I, I agree with you. Like the very organization that we should trust to do a thorough investigation is not the one that people have a lot of trust that they're going to do a thorough investigation. Right. Yeah. And the FBI has been acting in a very untrustworthy way uh, before, you know, let's say they even did target Donald Trump for investigation and nothing came of it. They could always say, look, we didn't find the evidence that we expected to find, or they could say, Hey, we made a mistake. So-and-so got fired for it. We're going to come clean. They've never done any of that. They've just covered up and covered up and covered up their own wrongdoing and denied a lot of things that were obvious. So when you when we have a national crisis where the, the top presidential candidate is almost assassinated and the FBI takes charge of the investigation, how can you trust those doing the investigating? Yeah. What would you say to uh, Democrats out there uh, or maybe people that don't like Donald Trump that are now saying uh, he staged this whole event in order to get sympathy votes? I, I mean. Uh, the, the just the fact that guns were involved uh, would make this incredibly risky. Um, the the fact that on camera he miraculously turns his head with like one microsecond before losing the back of his brains, like to me it's disgusting. But I see YouTubers, especially in like California, New York, they're going around on the street. What do you think of the Trump assassination? And they're saying he faked it, he staged it. The whole thing is a scam. He's a big con artist. What, what, what would you say? Like, there, there's a lot of complication in this event. It, it's insane. Can you imagine just, just the wind variation of shooting, you know, 
<laughs> makes a difference between life or death. Who would ever, who, I, who on earth would ever stage something to have his head as the target from 140 yards away? It's just, you know, it, this is insane, crazy stuff. But a lot of the people who are spreading these theories are also the people who are are upset that the assassin missed. Which is which is so gross to me. Even even members of government leadership that went on Twitter and said things like, you know, don't miss next time. I mean, I think those people, there should be, you know, ramifications for their disgusting uh, comments. You know, if, if you were to fake or stage something, you you would you would be better off saying like, hey, uh, we're going to have you lose 10 pounds. We're going to put two uh, bulletproof vests on you. And we're going to have a sniper hit you right in the bulletproof vest, right? Like you wouldn't make the head the target. Anyway, it's it's ridiculous. I don't even want to go further. It's down. really sick stuff. And and at least at least the leaders of the government did call it an assassination attempt right away. So these people out there are, are worse than nut jobs. And then they accuse conservatives of being the conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Kimberly Cheadle, the the head of Secret Service. Uh, she sits just below Alejandro Mayorkes over at Department of Homeland Security. As you mentioned, he's saying, I have 100% confidence in this woman. Um, she was asked why Secret Service had no men authorized to be on the roof where Trump was shot from. And her answer was that the roof was too steep and posed a safety risk when in fact most former snipers are saying it was the perfect place it had nice slope it gave a vantage point and it gave cover from incoming fire her like it, it was too steep to investigate to put bodies on to have watchers what are your thoughts on her comments it's insane first the first you saw the photos of the secret service guys standing over the body on that roof that that roof doesn't have much more of a pitch than a wheelchair ramp i used to be a roofer a long time ago i i put a roof on my house myself last year and that's a that's a 30 degree angle so this that was that roof you know and i'm 62 years old and i'm climbing roofs with a much steeper pitch than the roof that was used by that sniper yeah to me it's like okay they you know I, again, this to me right now, I'm just going with this is a major breakdown in communication. Um, you know, I'm I'm trying to be patient, but at the same time, we, we want answers. Uh, so many former snipers have said in interviews that th this would have been a place to have a group of people up on that roof watching. So you have the counter snipers up, up from a vantage point above Trump looking out. But then you would have people watching, at least with binoculars. Um, I mean, he had a perfect line sight right to the president's head. And yet nobody was manned on that. Um, we don't even know whether they did a sweep or, or maybe you do. But from what I'm reading, uh, it, it sounds like they're saying, oh, the police were going to handle that. Police are saying, no, it was Secret Service. It's, it's literally within 150 yards, which is an easy shot for anybody who's practiced uh you know sniping with a rifle what do you uh, do you think this is just miscommunication or where where do your thoughts go let me take 60 seconds to interrupt and tell you about something that has me incredibly concerned if you're a homeowner like me when is the last time you checked your home title you know the legal document that shows you own it if your answer is never then you might be a part of the fastest growing scam called home stealing I recently saw a demonstration on how easy it is, and I was shocked. This is a quick claim deed. You fill this out, and you take it in with an address, a name, and a fake signature. The document then gets stamped by a fake notary seal, which you can buy on the internet. You pay a small fee, and boom, the county official transfers your name off of the title and into the new criminal's name without you ever knowing it. But scammers don't want your house. They want the equity in your house. They know that because of values going up, that most Americans have value or home equity in their house. They take that and then they get loans against your collateral, leaving you with a financial and legal nightmare. 
but you can protect yourself from these criminals using home title locks, triple lock protection at hometitlelock.com. The first step is to go to the website and see if your home title is still in your name. Just go to hometitlelock.com, enter your address and get a complete title scan to see if you're already a victim. Use promo code Gardner for this scan and get free 30 day trial of triple lock title protection, totally free. The link is down below, hometitlelock.com, promo code Gardner. Go do it right now, hometitlelock.com. Well, it, it, there could be miscommunication to the public because the Secret Service really doesn't have a skilled public affairs or communication team. But the fact is there's no real credible spokesman for what's going on right now. Uh, they could just say, look, we don't have all the answers yet. We, you know, please bear with us while we get those answers. They're not doing that. They're just winging out answers and non-answers. I do know from having attended and participated in the planning of certain other events requiring Secret Service protection, that in these cases where there's an area uh, within the perimeter that's uh, vulnerable, they would go in and they'd park tractor trailer trucks in there to prevent a line of sight from any potential sniper further off. They never even bothered to do that. And you've got all this finger pointing now between Secret Service uh, against the, uh, the state police and the FBI being the spokesman and not being able to answer uh, anything to do with the Secret Service issues because the FBI is doing the investigating. The FBI was not supposed to be and it was not involved in the security part of it. So so, so you just have a mess. There's no single messaging coordinator here. But you know what? Something I got to say, I'm glad that there's no single message coordinator because they'd be able to cover up more if they really had a capable team. They'd be able to mislead us more if they had a capable team. So what you have out there now are citizen journalists and just people with phones and locals talking to locals or to other journalists. And so the public is learning these facts even before the FBI learns these facts. And we're able to start asking a lot of questions. Senator Ron Johnson just sent out a magnificent letter today to the Attorney General and to the Secretary of Homeland Security demanding information now on some of this so that he he's an accountant by profession so he he loves to, to manage uh, and he's magnificent at managing data he wants to have it all out there in real time so that he can so that we can map this out in a transparent way uh, I, I'm going to post that on my uh, X site later on probably right after this interview yeah I had uh, Charlie Spearing he's a journalist for the the Daily Mail on and uh, he just happened to be one hour away on family vacation. He told his wife, I hate to cut this short, but you know, we've got a, like a once in a lifetime story and the president's okay. He drives up there and does exactly what you just said. He starts snooping around, investigating. He's the gentleman that broke the story on the police having interaction, having photos with this man, being a little bit on high alert, uh, the policeman going up the ladder, having the rifle pointed at his head and threatened. He's the he's the journalist that broke all of that. How did he do that? By just talking to everybody in the area that he could. And so I, I think you're right. I think we're going to get a more honest uh, picture of what really happened by by getting you know many many vantage points versus one single person trying to control a narrative or cover up for the, uh, the the Secret Service or Kimberly Cheadle or or whatever it might be. Um, and I, I look forward to those answers coming out. Um, I, I'm also reading that um, the, the Secret Service, uh, Kimberly Cheadle has complained that they're having staffing issues. Um, but one of her one of her main focuses when she got into a leadership role, was that she wanted 30% of Secret Service to be women because women deserve the right to protect the president. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on this? I mean, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, I, you know, I, I don't want this to become like a sexist matter or whatever, but you saw this like five foot woman trying to get her body up over six foot five President Trump. He could have been taking bullets had there been a second sniper. Right. Right. I mean, first, first, nobody deserves to protect the president of the United States. You don't deserve to. I don't deserve to. No, none of us deserve to. What it is, people being protected by the Secret Service deserve to be protected by the best people possible. 
Now, if it's a six foot tall woman who can do everything a man can do, not a problem. If, but if, if you're, if you're not physically or mentally, um, you know, the same as the top people that the Secret Service has in terms of qualification, you shouldn't be in there. And the Secret Service has a two tier uh, qualification system. Men have a different set of qualifications than women do. And if, if men don't make their own qualifications, they can't just identify as women, or maybe they can't, I don't know, uh, and, and, and go for the women's qualifications, like some of these, uh, some of these guys who, who join women's uh, athletic teams because they can't compete in the men's team. Maybe that's what's happening to the Secret Service, too, because DEI includes gender and gender identification. So maybe that's what we're seeing happening. But when you have it so that they are physically incapable of protecting the president, or in case of that second Secret Service woman who was behind the president, she was photographed cowering yeah. behind the president off stage as the others were rushing away. So to the credit of the first female Secret Service agent, regardless of her stature, she was putting herself in harm's way by defending the president as best she could. The other one hid. Yeah, yeah. Let me actually put up this photo. Uh, I, I, I should have got the, the zoomed out one. It, it, this is going to be an iconic photo for many, many years. You have you know, what looks like an upside down uh, flag, which is the signal for distress. And then you have uh, President Trump, uh, for lack of a better word, rebelling against the, these orders because he wants to tell the people to fight and that he's OK. But but you see the, the female Secret Service, she can't get up and above him. Uh, he's so big. And even though she she's doing her best, uh, again, I don't want to make this a male female issue, but um, you, you can just see how big he is compared, um, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful for this photo, but at the same time, had, uh, had there been a second sniper from the water tower or someplace else, his entire front side is completely exposed to more rounds coming in. Yeah. yeah. yeah and it also says something else, because look at those Secret Service agents there doing their job. They, they, they're trained to grab the president by the belt and some pull him and some push him and they cover and then, then push him downward as they're pushing him forward and they cover him with their whole body mass. Imagine a man like Donald Trump under fire like that, who stops all five or six of them, pushes his way up and forces his way loose from them to make that gesture of defiance and to tell everybody to fight and that he's going to be OK. That's just astonishing right there. So yeah. He went against all his protocols, but to his great credit as a statesman, that was an amazing thing to see. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, now that now that it's in the past, it's going to be one of those iconic photos that will be looked at. Uh, yeah. But in the moment, wow, you know, we, the, nobody knows if there's a second shooter. Nobody, you know what I mean? Like, there's just so many. Even though they're telling him, you know, the shooter, the shooter's been taken out, and he's, you know a little bit uh, <laughs> uh, knocked around saying, you know, get my shoes, let me get my shoes, you know? And then he realizes like, wait a minute, I've got to stand up here and show that I'm a courageous leader and, and, and does the, the, the fist pump, which then the crowd goes wild. They start chanting USA, USA. I mean, it's a really like, it, it was a weird thing where there could have still been danger and yet it was a beautiful oh, uh, yeah. thing to watch. Yeah. Um, you know, that, now that you just raised another point too about a second yeah. shooter. The the FBI said before the assassin's phone was even opened, they declared definitively that he acted alone. How can anybody believe that? They didn't yeah. have the evidence. Yeah, and, and you know, taking almost four days to get into his phone. Like, what what do you have? A CIA encrypted Bitcoin phone or? You know, it just seems it seems a little bit uh, weird. Um, you well, know, if it was an iPhone, it would have been hard. But the the there are you know, I, I know a lot of people who could break into that. You probably do too. It's not a it's not a terribly difficult thing to do. It's it's probably a legal issue uh, on getting a warrant to open the phone. We just don't know. But the fact is that they said definitively that he acted alone before they had even opened his phone. Yeah. You're better connected than I am, Michael. My, my, the people I know that could get into that phone, it would have been with a hammer uh, <laughs> instead of uh, encryption or, or with uh, legal permission. Um, 
you know, we're still learning a lot uh, about uh, Thomas Matthew Crooks, uh, but just from the little we can see, um, bit of a loner, major chip on his shoulder, hatred of Republicans, hatred of former President Donald Trump. Um, you know, there are videos online that people are still trying to confirm where he's telling people to, you know, slit the throats of Republicans and that they're just horrible. But like you say, they, they declare, you know, in, in less than 10 hours, oh, he's a lone gunman. And then he's a 20 year old, you know, uh, male um, that somehow outsmarted the police, outsmarted the FBI, outsmarted the Secret Service. This is where I think the conspiracy theories start to creep in and people go, how, how could this have happened? How could somebody get up on this roof? How could someone be walking around in broad daylight with a giant rifle uh, and a lat? Like, there's still so many questions that need to be answered. Yeah. Yeah. And when you don't have when you don't have credible messengers. You're going to get conspiracy theories as people try to explain in their minds first, how did it happen and why? And then why are we not getting credible messaging from the authorities who we always used to trust or we could, yeah. you know, we could, we could largely trust. And then, of course, from the from the uh, mainstream journalism, can't trust them either. So so we tend to it's a, it's human nature to try to draw theories together of if two or more people conspire to do something and that's a conspiracy. So conspiracy theory has been, you know, vilified as a term, but it's a real term. But then you get the real nutcases out there making the malicious uh, conspiracy theories like you were describing before that, you know, the Trump people had set this up to, to make him look like a hero. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. So yeah, you, you can go to like conspiracy that becomes true and then conspiracy that leads to somebody like Matthew Crooks going, this man is Hitler. Anyone would have taken a chance to take out Hitler. I will try to take out Hitler, right? Like they, they yeah. make that jump in their mind where they're so riled up and angry that they feel like someone has to do something and then they do something incredibly stupid. Yeah. So you think that shooter was 20 years old and for nine years, for almost half his life, he had been given a, a drip bag constantly. That Trump is a Putin tool. Trump is a traitor. Trump is Hitler. Trump is worse than Hitler. Well, really? Think of it. If, you, if, we, if somebody could have stopped Hitler back in 1929, you know, would have would have saved the world, right? So then you start getting into I don't know, it's the the video game world or just the loner world where you think, man, I can be a hero, or I really hate this guy, but he's, I am justified in committing this act of murder because I am stopping a Hitler. So you really have to blame all these different individuals and organizations who did conspire together to create the narrative that Trump is a Hitler and has to be stopped at all costs. Yeah. I believe the mainstream media has played a large role in that uh, as well. And it, it's been interesting to watch their reaction right now. Uh, they're being fairly docile and fair. Uh, I think they're nervous to be their same Trump hating aggressive um, network, uh, you know, broadcasting because of the, the situation. And yet, like you say, it's been it's been eight years of just dripping on people how awful this man is, how awful the country was. Um, and there's people that are running with that message. Many people reject it. Like you, you guys are crazy, um, you know, to hear like Robert De Niro say that he knows what it's like to live under Hitler because he lived under Trump. Like, are you crazy? Right. It, like, right. you know, you get these crazy nut jobs um, out there. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is a young man that has, uh, in a sense had, you know, I, I don't want to say like MK ultra, but he, he's been received programming for many, many years that this is an evil person, uh, that you need to, to, to take out. And someone, someone finally did, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah and of course we have to be cautious about drawing conclusions from his own motivations and upbringing because we still don't know, but it's just common sense. Who else out there has been influenced for almost half their lives to think Trump is so evil like Hitler that somebody needs to take him out? And when you hear the president of the United States using bullseye and target and remove 
and eliminate, and his whole campaign, and United States senators and members of Congress saying it, and entertainment figures in the big media industry, where they're profiting from this kind of talk by riling people up, they're 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 they should be held liable for this, for creating this this uh, this atmosphere where it's legitimate to assassinate a presidential candidate that they don't like. Yeah. Uh, Representative Dan Goldman said, you know, uh, you know, Trump is this Hitler like figure uh, that will ruin democracy. He needs to be extinguished. Um, I I saw another major. I wish I had her name. um, uh, Another major lady. She said, you know, after the the Roe v. Wade thing, okay, Biden, you now need to give permission to take him out, have him taken out, you know, and then after the after the immunity case. You, you had a Supreme Court justice saying, you know, oh, could could Biden, you know, therefore have uh, Team Sill 6 take out the previous president? And then you had people say, it, repeating that same rhetoric on Twitter that Trump should be taken out and that Biden would have immunity. I, I mean, it's it's crazy, crazy thinking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah even and, and, and think of the people inside our system, inside the government who have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution and to keep us all safe, people inside the FBI who were sad that the assassin's bullet didn't kill Trump. The FBI has hired these types of people. They are are on duty right now. There's no shortage of them. And the FBI is content to shelter them and to promote them until such time as they're exposed and they embarrass the Bureau. So we had a wonderful case today where a former FBI man who was a, who was a whistleblower, Kyle Serafin, exposed one of these anonymous people inside the FBI. She worked in the firearms training division and then in another unit that, that, was, uh, that would do the instantaneous gun checks on people. And she said something on social media to the effect that she, she wished that the assassin had succeeded. So that was all circulating internally within the FBI. The FBI took no action until Kyle Serafin, he's part of a group called the Suspendables, came out and posted her statements and her details and what office that she worked in. And she was sacked today. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. So okay. One of many more to come, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just, you, I mean, I know people have private thoughts, but when you make them public, especially on the internet, like that stuff is not deletable, right? Like no, but uh, when, when you're working for the FBI, Yes. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're if you're just an individual. It kind of does matter because it shows the sign of the society's sickness when you think it's okay to assassinate a political leader here at home. But but this is a person who worked for the FBI. Yeah. And under under the DEI ideology, it's fine to have this kind of extremism within the FBI if it's coming from a certain ideological wing. FBI Director Ray has made a point to hire radicals in all positions in the Bureau and to artificially promote them. So it's Christopher Ray's fault for create, just as it is with the Secret Service leader, for creating atmospheres inside those organizations to promote you know, a cultural radicalism, a, a cultural revolution against society through diversity, equity, and inclusion, and all of the, all the extremism that that brings with it. Yeah. Uh, going, going back to the mainstream media, uh, I don't understand why they would do this or think that people wouldn't look into it, or maybe they're just hoping people are stupid and don't read beyond the headlines. But uh, their their first reaction after Trump is shot, not, I mean, he hasn't even gone to the hospital. We don't know what kind of bodily harm he's dealing with. They're putting out articles such as Trump ends uh, rally early after falling down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Trump leaves early after being spooked by loud noise. Yeah. Uh, Secret Service interrupts Trump rally after loud noises. Like, what? What? Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. is the mainstream media not held accountable uh, for putting out such blatant misinformation and lies? Yeah. Well, they, they're. <laughs> Well, this is a good thing about citizen action and social media, because most of those reporters have a social media account of some kind. Their editors have a social media account of some kind. And for most of those journalists, they don't have very big followings. So if the if the public was to just gang up on them, ridicule them, because reporters hate nothing more than ridicule, 
show what sloppy, crappy journalism they have and and hold them accountable. That'll that will at least ruin their day, if not make some of them a little more careful. The, the problem with headlines, though, is that the, the reporters seldom write their own headlines. It's the copy editor who writes the headlines. But fine. Dump on the reporters anyway. Hold them accountable for what the copy editors do, because now you're going to be fomenting strife within the newsroom. That's great because these these, quote, news organizations really need to have it uh, fed back to them and have it to pay a price internally, um, you know, a, a political and psychological price and a credibility price uh, for lying to us and for misleading. Now, now, so, so, and it's not like things happen so quickly that they just had to rush a headline up there. No, it took time to process the photo and to write the article and to write the headline. And it, so even if it took just a half an hour to do, the facts were already out there within the first minute. Yeah. Like to me, it would be an embarrassment um, to like, I, I can't imagine putting out a YouTube video, Donald Trump falls at rally, you know, like. Yeah. I, I would expect my channel to lose lots of subscribers. I I would expect to lose credibility. Like it would be bad. It would be bad news. Um, I just can't believe they did that. And then CNN wonders why they've lost 90% of their viewership since Trump left office. And then they put out a headline like uh, Trump ends rally early after falling. Like, <laughs> gosh, yeah. it's yeah. so dumb to me. Yeah. Well, you know, these journalists are in like a club. So where they're they're congregated in a city like, say, Washington, D.C., a lot of them hang out together. They know one another. They socialize together. And when you can get in there and break that unity and cause them to become objects of ridicule among their colleagues, especially with rival or friendly rival institutions, it, it really uh, it really demoralizes them. And, and they need they need that kind of treatment because people don't push back. They just complain about Washington Post or CNN or New York Times, but get to the reporters individually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it just, it kind of makes my brain go. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, are, are, are there any other big stories that uh, your um, Center for Security Policy are, are working on or that we should be aware of that uh, just off the top of your head? Well, yes, yeah, some of our stories are, are no big deal right now because the public's not interested because there's no controversy about them. So when something breaks out, we'll have something off the shelf. Um, so something like, for example, what if the grid goes down, the electrical grid with an electromagnetic pulse or sabotage from these what now 50,000 military aged Chinese who've snuck across our border thanks to the boss of the head of the Secret Service. So, I mean, we, we're working on a lot of things like that. We're working on state level. Uh, matters to empower the states to resist pressure from the central government to spy on their own citizens and so forth, because the state police and sheriffs are very important tools for the FBI and other uh, central government agencies to to surveil or abuse the public and the, the local law enforcement and especially the sheriffs have a right to, to a right and a, a constitutional duty to push back against that. So those things don't seem very exciting until something comes up. But those are two of our priority issues. And then, of course, the the issue of uh, what I wrote in Big Intel, um, which came out in January, but it still it has policy implications. There are two chapters in Big Intel about how what to do with the FBI and the CIA and, wh and what the next president can do. So there are some two full chapters to start a public debate on it. So I'm not trying to offer all the solutions. I'm just trying to offer a lot of ideas to have the debate. And fortunately, groups like the Heritage Foundation, the America First um, Policy Institute, and others who are working on transition programs have been working with me and some of my colleagues at the Center for Security Policy on a lot of these ideas to turn them into policy if President Trump is elected and allowed to assume office. Okay, interesting. Do you do you think uh, if Trump gets back into office that he will seriously consider reforming the CIA and the the FBI? Yes, he he went in before without a team, without a strategy, and without a real plan. So unlike Reagan or Obama or Biden, he didn't go in with a list of executive orders. So these are presidential decrees, essentially that that are part of running government, it's normal to have them, to amend existing 
um, executive orders from other presidents. This is to tell the government how to operate, how it shall and shall not operate. Uh, and then to repeal certain of those executive orders and then to put in his own executive orders so that he can implement his own policies. Trump didn't do that in the first term. He's learned his lesson now and so have a lot of the people around him and he's much wiser for having been burned. So, so yes, I would absolutely expect him to implement these things uh, the first day he's president. Okay. I, I think he learned how wide and deep the swamp really is. And uh, I have heard from other people that I respect say this time he's coming in with his eyes open and with a team where last time he, he knew that something was off and then he didn't have the people. And I mean, look how many people he had to burn through because they kept trying to betray him. Now he's, he's built a very different team. I, I watched the RNC and uh, he, he has so much, much support going in this second time. I'm really excited to see what happens um, uh, and, and the changes that he will bring, especially to the border, uh, economically, uh, these, these wars that we're involved in. I, I think it's going to be an interesting first 100 days yeah. um, uh, in, back in office. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for, for joining me. I'm going to put a link to Big Intel down below. It's a great book. You break down uh, the progression of this incredible uh, organization, the FBI, the CIA, and, and how they've become tools for the left. Um, and I appreciate all the research that you put into that. If people want to follow you online, where can I point traffic to so that they can follow you? Well, you can follow me on Twitter or X at J. Michael Waller and follow us at the Center for Security Policy. Uh, our website is securefreedom.org. Securefreedom.org. Okay. I'll make sure to put all of that down below. Thank you for spending time with me today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Great to be with you again, Stephen.